This is Film Talk, where we interview the brightest minds in filmmaking five days a week. Do you need a great camera for your next shoot? You may want to consider the world's lightest handheld Super 35 digital film camera, Blackmagic's Ursa Mini 4.6K. The Ursa Mini boasts a 4.6K sensor, global shutter, and up to 15 stops of dynamic range. It's perfectly balanced for handheld use and comfortable enough to be used all day long. Scene one, take one. Film Talk Nation, we are greenlit for yet another great show. Vanessa Frank here, and I'm excited to bring you our featured guest today, Forrest Connor. Forrest, are you ready for your close-up? I am. Forrest Connor is the in-house data scientist for digital distribution company VHX, where he analyzes both filmmaker and audience behavior to create insights into effective models of distribution for independent films. VHX is a digital distribution platform that empowers independent artists and distributors to sell video content and connect directly with their audience. Forrest graduated from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in 2006 with a dual degree in computer science and psychology, specializing in artificial intelligence research. He subsequently worked in the tech world until his entry into the dual MBA MFA program at NYU Tisch School of the Arts and Stern School of Business. Through this dual degree program, he focused his study on independent film production and entrepreneurship in the film industry, while also producing numerous award-winning short films and web series. In addition, he is a 2014 fellow of NYU Cinema Research Institute, where he explored the connections between film and audience through a system of creating common personality types. Titles that have used VHX for online distribution include Golden Globe nominated Aziz Ansari's stand-up show Dangerously Delicious, Sundance Film Festival winner Indie Game the Movie, Oscar winner Kevin Spacey's documentary Now in the Wings on a World Stage, and Golden Globe nominated Zach Braff's Wish I Was Here. VHX is backed by, amongst others, Chris Sacker and William Morris Endeavor. Forrest, it's an honor to have you on the show today. It's great to be here. That was quite an introduction. <laughs> well, you are quite an amazing man. I have to say, you're, it, it, it's really quite possible that you might be the most intelligent um, human being I've ever spoken to. Um, so <laughs> I'm really excited um, to have you on the show today um, and just to delve into this crazy world of uh, data research and film, which is, I think, something that's becoming increasingly relevant in this world of, of Netflix and online streaming. Um, so, Forrest, before we get in, dug into all of that, I would just love it if you could give us a little bit of insight into how you got into this field. I mean, obviously, I've just shared some of your academic achievements, but I would love to know how to start with you even had a desire to start going into this field. Sure, yeah. The, um, the basic uh, you know, way that I got started was like so many other people who start making movies is uh, I got a bunch of friends together. We we borrowed a camera and we started shooting, you know, short films for for little competitions here and there, yeah. or you know, things that we could we could just easily do in, in the course of a weekend, you know, in between our our work to, our working jobs. So, mm. um, I was in the Bay Area out in California uh, with a lot of other people who sort of arrived uh, from all over the country at the same time, and we wanted to have some outlet to express ourselves creatively, and uh, and so we just started filming little things here and there and having fun and you know, uh, putting on stupid accents that we couldn't pull <laughs> off at all. And, uh, you know, and, and it just was really freeing to be able to write something and then act in it and produce it and, and yeah. you know, change directors as frequently as you want. And um, and so that's really w was the start of it. Um, I was sort of looking to get out of the, the tech world at the time when I lived there. Um, and so many of my friends were looking to graduate school to do that. And I I thought that was a, the route that I wanted to follow as well. Mm. And when I started looking into what graduate schools offered, um, I, I stumbled upon this dual degree program at NYU, which really focuses on the producing end of film. And uh, I thought that was perfect for me. I'd always been very, um, very organized, uh, very motivated. And I thought that I could do a really good job of you know, putting those talents behind uh, mm. filmmakers whose artistic vision I really respected. Yeah. So that was my that was my goal, and and um, came to the program in 2010 with that in mind. So uh, from there, that's that was the beginning of everything. Just uh, trying to to act as a producer on behalf of of my colleagues and some of my friends in the, mm. the program. 
So fast forward to today, you're now working at VHX as a data scientist. And by the way, I just quickly have to interject for our audience who are not, maybe some of whom are maybe not yet familiar with VHX. I just want to provide a quick endorsement that I am not just a fan of VHX. I'm like a super, super, super fan <laughs> of VHX. <laughs> we um, used uh, VHX's platform um, for the release of my first movie. And honestly, if it was not for VHX, I don't know that we could have had the success in our independent release that, that we had. Um, that movie has now been seen in, I believe, more than 53 nations. Um, um, in many, many locations that um, we traditionally would never have been able to get into, um, like a, a lot of um, uh, Middle Eastern and Eastern European countries that um, typically, traditionally, would maybe not be open to the to the message of that movie. Um, and we have had uh, just, we have found it to be such a boon um, to be able to use all of the tools that VHX gives us in terms of being able to instantly send screeners, to be able to instantly provide uh, the, the movie subtitled in 19 foreign languages. I mean, the list of tools, I'm sure as a filmmaker, I've only kind of scratched the surface of what VHX does, but I've personally recommended it to many independent filmmakers. I think for anyone who is looking to do an independent release, in my mind, there just there is not a better platform um, to be found online than, than VHX. But all that said, um, so far as today, you are um, an in-house data scientist for VHX. I just love it if you could unpack for audience a little bit of what that means. Sure. Well, well. First of all, thank you for that uh, amazing endorsement, and it's, it's you know things like that that really uh, inspire us to do what we do here, and, and also specifically in my job, um, it, it's the thing that I I look forward to most. So yeah. you know, you having you having success uh, using our platform really helps us uh, understand what works for people and what doesn't mm. work, and how we can and, and how we can and make like, our, just our even platform you, better. Just even the fact that you guys handle all of the customer service. We, on our physical good side of things, we have to handle our own customer service, and it has just been a, a real education to us to realize just how much work is involved in that. I think it's kind of part of the conversation that gets uh, forgotten when it comes to um, the enthusiasm that there is in the market these days for independent distribution, that there is a very real downside that um, when you are independently distributing, if someone has a problem with the DVD, if someone has a problem with their credit card, if their delivery is not received, you're gonna be the one getting the phone call. And for us to have have a team in place that beautifully and seamlessly handles all of our customer service issues on the digital side of things and does that as you know basically just for the you know the commission that we pay out um, that's not an extra cost it's invaluable it's absolutely invaluable anyway I'll let you speak well, now yeah, and I have to, <laughs> I'll, I'll give all due credit to our uh, our support team uh, they're they're really amazing at their job yeah. to, you know, Steve, Steve in particular is is uh, all hands on deck all the time, making mm. sure everybody's you know taken care of, and uh, and so yeah, things like that that allow us to you know make life easier for you. That's really kind of what my job is all about. Okay. So data science is a is a very technical term, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're a data scientist at Netflix, you might be working on the recommendation engine that's saying, you know, if you watch this, then you'll really yeah. like this. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's less what I do. Uh, what I do is more looking at how our publishers are using our platform and finding out what works for them and, and why it works and mm -hmm. then helping improve that and then finding what doesn't work and trying to come up with ways to make it better or yeah. deciding if we even need that feature at all. Mm. Um, really making those level of decisions um, based off of the data that we see on behalf of both our publishers and the people who watch their content. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's been really, uh, you know, really interesting for me coming from a filmmaking background uh, to see what the problems are in the independent film space, especially if you're managing your own distribution um, and then helping to alleviate some of those problems. So, you know, customer support for one, sure. Uh, but another is many people who try and release their own film have a hard time uh, getting a reliable player. That's always going to, Oh know, my gosh! The yeah, best quality film. You know, to because I know, I, so, I know. Um, before I had VHX recommended to me, 
um, I was looking at a range of different options in the market and it's kind of honestly, it's a scary, it's a scary, a scary choice to make when you honestly don't know who's going to be around in 18 months and who isn't. And, um, and, and there's there's glitchiness issues, there's compatibility issues. And so for us, when we were introduced to VHX, it was very much that moment of relief of being like, oh, wow, this actually feels like a reliable website. I'm not worrying here that these guys might disappear into thin air in a few months time. And with it, my entire digital platform. Right. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we've always wanted to make sure that that was sort of, uh, you know, you know, conveyed not only to the people who use our platform to sell, but also the people who want to, to purchase on our platform. Yeah. It's one of the reasons that we, you know, sort of stand strongly uh, by default against digital rights management, which keeps you from moving, you know, your content from, you know, this one player to another device to your TV. Mm-hmm. Um, we think that if you purchase something from someone, you know, it, it's yours, you own it, and you should be able to watch it on whatever device you have. And, and that, that really um, is communicated directly to the consumer because that is a level of trust and safety that they feel, you know, on behalf of your product. So um, we want them to have the best experience uh, yeah. as well, uh, you know, in addition to what we provide for our publishers. And in terms of some of the solutions that you guys have been able to put together for independent filmmakers who are looking to self-distribute, what are what are those? What are kind of the specific areas that you guys have been able to, you feel you've been able to successfully tackle? Sure. Yeah. So the uh, you know there are two sides to filmmaking that I think are really interesting when it comes to self distribution. One is you know you're always going to have people that you're speaking to that are in the industry. So you know your agents, managers, um, people who run like you know, theatrical companies can actually yeah. place your film on the big screen. Um, and you know if you're looking to communicate with those people, they they you know are very interested in the classical screener model. Yeah. So we provided screen you know, we provide screeners for our publishers. Um, that are watermarked and time limited so that you can tell, you know, you, you give somebody a free copy of your movie to watch, but they're not going to share it. They're not going to download it and send it to their assistant mm. who's going to send it to their friend and, and all of that. So we, we provide those, you know, industry level tools um, that are, you know, competitive with, with similar tools from other companies yeah. um, and hopefully more, hopefully more secure. Um, and then there's the other side of it, which is um, sort of you're directly managing the relationship between you and your audience. And so you need tools to do that as well. Mm. And uh, we've, we've seen that our, we, we allow people to sort of subscribe to your website without actually purchasing. So you can have a list of people who want to follow what you're doing and learn more about your, uh, you know, your advancements in film and then the next project you're working on. Um, and so you can collect their email addresses and communicate directly with them. Um, and we have a tool for that, which is we, we call it updates, but that allows you yeah. to both – uh, post to a blog and also email all of your followers. Yeah. Um, you know what you're working on, what your latest you know thing is. You know, oh, I just started a new Kickstarter, so yeah. you know, let me, let me <laughs> tell everybody who cares about me like that I'm working on that. Yeah. Um, so that's a really great tool. And then you know, if you're self-distributing, you're also basically running a business. And some of the ways that um, we help with that process um, is we allow for you to to generate coupons, uh, to give people discounts. Uh, we've seen really effective use of those coupons for like. Mm. flash sales over a weekend yes um, you say, oh you definitely. can get my film now for 50 percent off but you know, get which it, is so uh, we, you know we yeah. we found has been so brilliant when we've done black friday sales or christmas sales that sort of thing it takes all of about three minutes to generate that code and then you can very easily mount up a seasonal sale that can generate some extra sales for you um one of the one of the features that i Actually, I was I was thinking about this the other day. Wow, it's really amazing that VHX does this. I had a situation the other day where I was watching a movie on Amazon and I thought, wow, this is a really great movie and I would love to be able to gift this movie to somebody, not send them like an Amazon voucher that they can then use for the movie. I would just like to be able to directly purchase the movie and send them, a, send them an email with that link so that they get that movie for free. And there's no, as far as I could tell, there's no means to do that on Amazon, which was really frustrating to me because I've gotten so used to just assuming that everything's going to be like on VHX. Well, on VHX, if you want to 
gift a copy of a movie to someone, you can do, which for our audience, we found really useful because we have a movie that is very uh, sticky. It's very much about word of mouth. We have um, a lot of people who end up coming to purchase the movie through a recommendation of a friend or family member. Um, and so having that ability to wear, particularly during uh, Christmas and Easter, those kind of times when someone might want to might want to purchase a gift for someone it's so it's such a seamless process and and it kind of that, yeah it just really blew me away the other day looking at amazon being like oh wow this that feature isn't there that's really annoying <laughs> yeah well and we see uh, you know around holidays especially christmas um christmas even christmas day our sales jump almost 300 percent. so wow. if you have a film especially one that's tied you know to to a specific holiday yeah um you know ha having those tools at your fingertips really makes it yeah. easier for you as a seller to, to know what to do um, yeah. and and as, as an example we had a, a, a feature documentary called cowspiracy um which is a funny name but is uh is generally about like the the meat industry Overall, um, mm. they, they went on sale around Earth Day, um, and during the week surrounding Earth Day, they actually priced their movie at a dollar and turned on something called Pay What You Want, which allows you know, the people paying them mm. uh, to, to determine what the value of that film is. And they actually only saw about 30% reduction in the average price paid. So they were yeah. charging 10 bucks, and most people paid seven. Wow! But they doubled their they doubled their audience size. They went from nice. you know basically like a, a thousand to two thousand, but it was more than that. It was wow! You know, quite a quite a which large really number. stacks so, up. If you're if you're an independent filmmaker and you're selling a thousand units at seven bucks a time, and pretty much all of that money is going into your pocket, that can make a big difference. <laughs> um, exactly, yeah. So, Forrest, in terms of the the evolution of the industry, I know that when it comes to the online sector, this is a climate that we're seeing change almost by the day. Um, what is your viewpoint on what you believe we're going to be seeing coming up in the next few months and years in terms of... of it, distribution, online distribution, the independent side of things. Um, and what do you feel like the industry really needs to understand about this current climate? That's a really great question. I think there are different levels of, uh, you know, the industry and they're all sort of being affected different ways or in different ways. So the traditional, you can call it studio or, or mini major industry, which you know, consists of like a Weinstein company and Fox Searchlight for independent film. Um, they're they're going to start competing with online entities like Netflix and Amazon for content, and and the online companies don't have the same uh, you know restrictions. Like you know Netflix is generating money off of a recurring subscriber base, Amazon generates money because they sell you detergent. So yeah. they're not they're not beholden to the same economics mm. as the film companies are. So you're going to see fewer um, acquisitions from traditional companies, which really? I by and large think is. I think that's very good because those companies are not transparent at all. They don't tell no. you who your customer base is. They're they very you, creative you know, with their consuming. accounting. <laughs> exactly right. And so when you see Amazon and Netflix starting to, to pay money to filmmakers for their content, they're actually just paying uh, you know, a premium over the budget of the film mm. uh, to acquire the content. And then you don't have to worry about what happens after the fact with yeah. their advertising and all that. You just, you've made your money back. You've made a little bit of a profit. Yeah. And you can put that towards your next film. So in the, in the larger studio uh, world, I think that's what's going to happen. Um, and then on the, the independent side, you know, I think that people are now getting access to more tools that they can use um, themselves without needing to go through these um, arbiters of, of taste or, or preference. Exactly, so yes. Nobody, you, know, you, don't, you don't have to go to a festival anymore and pray that <laughs> one of five people likes your movie right. and, then, and then pays you a check. Um, yeah. You can actually go to a festival and talk to the people who watched your movie and say, if you liked it, please tell a friend, here's a coupon, give it to them for yes. free, or, uh, or I'll give you a free copy if you sign up for my mailing list. Like, yes. Yes. Um, these tools that used to not exist are now prevalent, and it's not just VHX. There are many other services mm. that that provide these things as well. So I think that it's um, you know it's a time for great entrepreneurship in film in, in the lower end of like the film market, where you can actually start to create uh, a business out of your creative endeavors, and that business can grow 
uh, rather than just be a one-time, oh, I made a film, sold it one time, yeah. and now I have to start all over again. Yeah. So every time, every time somebody buys something from you, they're now your your fan. You know, they're not yeah. just a customer. They're somebody that you need. Uh, you you know, have a relationship, relationship with, with over yeah. time. Yeah. yeah I that's, that's exactly right. I used to work in um, in distribution and and also in international sales, and it was a big shock to me early on in my career that I would have filmmakers call the office that I had been watching their movies in college. And, and I mean, there was one in particular, um, I won't name the title of the movie, but in the UK, it was a very iconic movie in the 90s that we would watch on repeat pretty much in the dorm, room, dorm rooms at my college. And that director called the office, my office one day, and I just completely freaked out, <laughs> just was so excited to get to speak to him and was saying, you know, oh my gosh, you know, your movie's so iconic and I must have seen it like 50 times and blah, blah, blah. And he tells me then about how he's really delighted to, to hear that, but I mean, he's never made a penny off of the movie. And it was like this really big shock of realizing, I mean, obviously I'd, I'd heard before um, stories like that, but to actually see that real life case study of um, someone who'd made a movie that was such a huge hit within my generation. And then he was as broke as Anna says, he was as, as broke as he was before he started making the movie. It was a pretty big lesson for me on, on why as a filmmaker, you want to, you want to make sure you have a piece of the pie. And obviously that, that was like 12 years ago. So, um, that was long before the days of solutions like VHX, but it really did prove to me that, um, you know, most of the time the, the people who make the money are the, the ones who are at the end of the chain, who've taken the least risk. And that the guy who was there developing it right at the beginning and putting in countless hours and nights of work on spec to make it happen is, is usually the guy, and at least up until these days, was typically the guy who just wouldn't see a dime. Yeah, that's right. And I also think if you're, you know, even if you're that director who makes a film that is iconic and, and gets uh, noticed, you, you're you're not carrying that audience with you. That audience now yeah. sort of goes towards the studio or whomever acquired yeah, the film. Yeah, you lose all that and data. So, exactly. And so mm. now you have to start over with your next film. And, you know, many people get, get uh, down a career path, which allows them, you know, the opportunity to, to find financing for their second film or third film. Um, but many people don't. And so that's why there's this curse of the, the first time filmmaker. Yeah. You may make one feature film and then, <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't have anywhere to go from there. Yeah. Like you go hard. back to working at Target. It's depressing. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, Forrest, in terms of what we as filmmakers can be doing better to, in terms of leveraging the data that we do have and our social media platforms, what simple things would you recommend as being kind of, um, you know, what, what we can be doing at home, so to speak, to ensure that we're working intelligently with the database that we have? Sure. So I think the easiest thing to do is to start a, an email list that uh, consists of people who, who have either seen something you've done or, or just care about you as a person. Yeah. Um, and the easiest easiest way to do that is just to ask every every person you know um, to sign up to begin with. And, and typically, I think in, in most uh, people's circles, we have about 150 people that we know by name whom we can mm -hmm. talk to. And, and if you can get those people onto a list and then start to engage with them and say that you are working on a new creative project and here's where you are on it and here's where you stand, uh, that project is likely to touch someone that they know um, yeah. and they will share that organically with that new person mm. and then they'll end up on your mailing list and so you can grow organically that way over over the course of a, a certain amount of time and I think that's the thing that most people are afraid to do which is really um, the very basic grassroots uh, generation of an audience through you know uh, understanding uh, understanding who they are and talking mm. to them about things that they want to know yeah um, so that's that's the lowest form of data collection <laughs> you know coming from <laughs> sort of a, a data side that's all that's all really just very personal Mm. Um, in addition to that, I think that there are some analytics tools. So any, anytime you sell a film, uh, you know, directly so that you are the, the one in charge of it, you should make sure that you're getting all the information back and it's not getting stuck in, in a middle ground. So 
sometimes that can't be helped if you're putting your film on iTunes. Yes. There's no negotiation <laughs> with them. Yeah. Uh, but if you use a tool like like DHX or like Gumroad or something like that, mm -hmm. they will provide you the email addresses of people who purchase things from you. Yes. Um, and so make sure to maintain those lists and keep them you know active and uh, and you know re ready to to act on when you have something mm. you know, new that you're working on. And then finally, I think understanding your overall reach uh, in the world is, is also important. So tools like Google Analytics are great for tracking, you know, visits to your website yeah. um, and also where those visits come from. Um, you know, if you are frequently uh, posting on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, um, trying to drive traffic back to your website, you want to know that that's working and you want to be able to make sure mm. um, that you're, you're seeing people uh, come from the, the massive outreach you're doing. So Google Analytics is a great free tool with a lot of resources um, to be able to, to track that. You can learn, learn how to do it very quickly. And it also integrates um, seamlessly with VHX. So that's a bonus. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, your social platforms are going to be um, a way to acquire people who are interested in your subject matter and, and like what you do. Um, I've never been very, uh, very much of a proponent of advertising on those platforms mm. because the return on that investment is not always, um, no. you know, not always great for a one-off film. But reaching out to people and talking to them is, and you yeah. can get people engaged in a conversation, and that's a great way to start. Um. I don't know whether you really have any whether you have any thoughts on the next question I'm going to ask, but one of the big um, uh, kind of um, issues that a lot of filmmakers that I know have with just doing a deal that goes where your movie is just going straight to Netflix or 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 a similar platform is precisely this issue of loss of data it's that um you have if, if you're then looking to get your next movie funded netflix isn't willing to give you the data as to how that movie is performed they're famously very closeted about their data which music titles have done well which titles haven't done well when it, which in a lot of ways is very understandable but where that becomes very problematic is when you as an independent filmmaker need to sit down in front of an investor and, and back in the day they would be looking at what it did theatrically, what it did in home entertainment. But if you do that deal where it goes straight to Netflix, financially it might be a great deal in that you might get all of your funds back and, and it definitely can, can open up an audience for you and there's a lot of benefits um, that behoove a filmmaker. But there is then the issue for movie number two of, hey, I, I don't have any data. You know, I'm saying the movie did well, but investors like to see figures and you have no figures to show or, or very, very few figures to show. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there is, um, you know, there are two ways about this and one would be to confront Netflix and, and sort of, you know, have a grasp. <laughs> confront Netflix. Of, of, I'm just, I'm exactly, laughing because I'm thinking how many industry professionals would love to confront Netflix right now. <laughs> Well, and that's the thing. You know, the first option is to organize, you know, a union of filmmakers to, to you know, beat down the doors and demand their data. <laughs> but that doesn't seem to be happening. There's no, no fever pitch for that. No. So, so rather, well, I think I think <laughs> than, I think plenty of people have tried, but ultimately they know that um, that they're holding all the cards and they have nothing right. or very little to gain by giving their data away. And so it's just, I mean, there's there's really no leverage to be able to to force that information out of them. Exactly. So that's that's a fool's errand almost. And so yeah. the the second solution is is to find a way to obtain um, you know the the audience that views your content on Netflix uh, in a, another way that doesn't preclude them seeing it on Netflix, but actually follows from it. So one thing that I've seen a filmmaker do very successfully is once their film launched on Netflix, they put up exclusive bonus material for that film on their site, uh, powered Ooh. by VHX, so that. Once someone saw it and was interested in it, they would yeah. seek out the website and they would offer, you know, uh, you can get our bonus content for a dollar and mm. you can see the behind the scenes. So it's a very, very low cost way That's of really getting that good. person's email address. Yeah, exactly. That's so really, it, really good. Really... I almost wonder, it's such a shame that there's probably no way to do like retargeted advertising on that, you know, um, but I'm guessing that's probably impossible. 
Right. So you can you could retarget. Um, there, there are probably tricks you could do. So yeah. you could launch some some SEO campaign that says your movie's title plus Netflix, and if people search mm. for that, then your 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 campaign yeah. pops up. And then you could you could retarget from there. Mm. Um, and also, you know, anyone who comes to your site, you should absolutely place a retargeting pixel on your site so that you could advertise to them in the future uh, yeah. if you felt so inclined. Um, but I, I feel like just offering someone uh, a really a really compelling package for a very low price mm-hmm. is going to be a great way to get those people who really loved your film on Netflix and just don't know what to do next to become yes. those super fans. So, That's so good. So that bonus content, <laughs> yeah, bonus content, behind the scenes interviews, all that kind of stuff um, is really powerful for engaging your super fans. So you know your your film goes on Netflix and it may be seen by you know tens of thousands of people, but the ones you care about are the ones who would seek out more information. Yeah, or they're at least going to be going to, I mean, I typically after a movie, after I've watched a movie, I'll go to its IMDb page. I might even look at, because I'm a filmmaker, I have a tendency to look at some of the industry reviews, you know, just because Mm -hmm. in these days, I I do feel that we've kind of lost something from those days when the only way to watch a movie or a, a was with a group of people and and as much as I'm really glad for um, the ability now to to binge watch, there was something very nice about when The Office would only come out on a Thursday and so on a Friday morning you'd be having that water cooler conversation. I think that's kind of something that we've lost a little bit with particularly with Netflix releasing 10 episodes of a show all at once is that you 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 no longer have that journey with other audience members and and so for me because that's something I miss as I think indeed a lot of people do the natural thing to do is to go to the IMDB you know kind of bulletin board or some of those online forums where there's actually a measure of conversation so that you can see whether other people had the same reactions as you did and so if I'm doing that it means probably other people are doing that and indeed that's a great opportunity to try to capture that traffic and to give them a great offer Um, and it's certainly something that I have to say I absolutely absolutely love with VHX is that there's um, such a multi-tiered opportunity to to be able to share different levels of bonus content with your audience. So for example, on my movie that I have with uh, VHX Let the Line Roar, we have, I think, something like an over, I, I think it's like an hour and a half of free bonus content that people get when they get the when they stream the movie, um, which is something that you don't get if you if you go to Amazon and you rent a movie or you buy a movie, you are only getting that movie, and so you're losing out in terms of volume of content. You're losing out on the experience of what you get when you get a DVD, where there's typically a certain amount of bonus features. The beautiful thing with VHX is that you can still get all of those bonus features that you would get with a disc and it provides filmmakers the ability to be able to price accordingly so for example we've chosen just to give people a comprehensive one comprehensive package but there would be the ability to for example um, offer the movie alone at one price point and then to upgrade people in their experience to okay if you also want the BTS documentary that's going to be an extra five bucks if you want the you know director's cut of the movie that's going to be another seven bucks and to actually give people the the option to choose what they want their price point to be versus their level of engagement which I think is is something that's very very unique to VHX and that we found has been a really great thing for audience engagement um Faris, in terms of in terms of the future with VHX I mean I know you guys have had an incredible ride the last few years um, just with seeing this platform grow at a a very, very fast rate and um, and also a number of incredible backers like Chris Sacker and William Morris Endeavor jump on board um, clearly because they can see the future and they can see that VHX is a fundamental part of what's going to be going on in the industry. What what are some of the things you guys are working on right now? If there's anything that you can share, and what is kind of your your vision for where you can see VHX going to? Sure. So I think one of the things that we're working on now is uh, we've seen a lot of people come from a, an ad based world uh, of like YouTube um, and, and you know similar platforms that have episodic content, and the uh, unfortunate reality is that advertising online and those 
there's a uh, world is very um, you know divided between the haves and the have nots. So yes. If you're if you're talking about the money you can make from ads on Hulu, that's great. But the money you can make from ads running your own independent YouTube channel is, it's is horrendous. Really not enough to it's sustain so bad. A business. Most people have, I think yeah. people kind of hear these stories about, oh my gosh, this YouTube star is making two, three, four million dollars a year, but they don't realize that when you actually look at how much someone is making per viewer, it's like slave labor almost. I mean, it's it's abysmal. Exactly. So we, we have a, um, a group that we've worked with that had a channel on YouTube um, with maybe 80,000 subscribers uh, by the time that they came to VHX. And they were making roughly, you know, between probably fifteen and thirty thousand dollars a year on oh my gosh. Uh, advertising on, on, on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. And they, they they came up with a brilliant idea. We didn't convince them to do this. They were smart enough to do it on their own to release uh, an entire season on YouTube, with the exception of the season finale, oh which my they gosh. on VHS <laughs> for three dollars. And so they made they made more on off of that release than they made on the entire past year wow. on, on YouTube. And that's so, so that's so smart because I think if that had been me, I would have be I would have thought, oh let's just go and do the whole series on VHX. And instead they had that wisdom to do kind of a hybrid model, which I think takes quite a bit of guts. And so yes, that's exactly right. And what they what they did afterwards is they said, well now we have we know that people will come to VHX and pay for our content. So we uh, help them build a subscription model platform so they can actually yeah. do the entire series on VHX and have people pay a monthly, you know, monthly yes. fee for access, very much like they built their own Netflix. So going back to what you were talking about, Netflix doesn't give you the data, um, but if you have enough content and that content speaks to uh, an audience that is very dedicated to, mm. to you know, paying for it, uh, you can generate your own business uh, on our platform. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Uh, without having to rely on someone else. And it's it's great because they, um, you know, were making $35,000 a year or so on, on YouTube, and now they're making that a month on VHX. That's so, nuts. That, that must have changed their lives as filmmakers. Yes. Yeah, and so now mm -hmm. they have five series that they're working on. They release a new episode every week. And, and they're trying to figure out how to grow their business from here. So yeah. uh, very entrepreneurial minded. And we, we think that subscription uh, platform for our sellers is going to be very, very it's huge. It's going to be big. Um, is that, we, do you feel like that's, that's, that's going to be a major new trend in the next few months? I think it can be, especially when people uh, start dedicating uh, their resources to working on that short form style of content. Yes. And I don't think that it's, I don't think it's necessary to abandon feature films I think you can work on both, and if your short-form content uh, provides you with the capital resources to then go and invest in mm. your feature film, that's all the better. You know, Netflix has films and TV shows, so why not why not be a, a creative individual who can tell your story through multiple mediums? Yeah. So, so I right. have a quick question um, in that regard. I have a friend who's a brilliant filmmaker. He uh, released a title. Um, that he independently uh, produced. He released it onto DVD a few years ago when the uh, the like bricks and mortar store retail uh, model of business was working really well. He then um, made a second movie that released a few years later and his sales were dramatically different just because the market has changed so much within that amount of time. Like it's quite, I think it was quite shocking for him to see the extent to which doing exactly all the same things as he did the first time around, the result was just so different because now it's it's increasingly rare that someone will go out to a store and, and buy a physical DVD. I mean, it's 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 not unheard of, but it's um, a fraction of the audience that it used to be. But what he does have is he has this huge following online of fans that he's built up. He's got a, a Facebook page that has a tremendous number of fans. And I know he's been looking to figure out for a while, or, or at least I get the sense he's been looking to figure out for a while what he can do with that. Um, just kind of mulling through, you know, some of the options in this market that we're in. Would he be the kind of candidate of a person who could bring that audience to you and say, this is the deal. I've got this audience. I've got X hundred thousand people who are on my Facebook page. You know, 
can you please work with me on helping me to figure out how I can migrate them towards some kind of a VHX model where I'm able to put out content to them where rather than me being paid like a fraction of a $5 DVD sale, I'm making like you know, 95% of a $15 sale. Is that something that you can kind of directly work with someone on? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we have an amazing uh, community manager here, uh, Paula, who is, uh, you know, really, really wonderful at thinking creatively with uh, filmmakers and, and publishers of all sorts as to what they can do to leverage audiences they already have and, and also grow those audiences. Yeah. Um, and in, you know, in addition to that, I'm, I'm always happy to look at things from the analytics side and say, well, it looks like you have traction in this space and this space, so let's focus on that. Um, we do provide some of those services for our publishers, um, and it's really, it's uh, it's sort of like a not uh, publicized thing that we do. Yes, well, it is now. It, 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 you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, the cat just, is just out of the of bag. <laughs> We're all just we're all just very nice people, and if you ask us questions, we tend to answer. Yeah. So it's yeah. uh, you know we we are absolutely happy to talk to people about their mm. their strategy for growing their audience and 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 then also you know leveraging the tools that VHX has in the in the appropriate ways. Yeah. For me, for me, the hard part, um, you know, if you're if you're on YouTube, your audience is used to watching your films on YouTube or your videos mm. on YouTube, and uh, that's already an online platform, so it's kind of easy to get them to, to cross them. The, yeah. the bridge to to VHX. Um, if you're just talking about people who like your page on Facebook, that's a little harder because you're not mm. sure exactly what their behavior is online. Yeah. So it, it takes a little more enticing. So giving things away for free or charging very, very little or tying it with a larger, um, you know, a larger movement or you know, something like that mm. is generally uh, the way to convert those people. But the good news is once you get them to convert from Facebook likes to people who actually follow your website or have purchased something from you, now you have their email address, uh, which makes them you know, makes them uh, very much more connected to you as an individual and yeah. as an artist. So I think that that is um, that is really powerful if you can sort of convert those audiences over. So yeah. we have a couple uh, a couple ways to do that, but I'm always happy to, to brainstorm new ways with anybody who's interested. Yeah, fascinating. Well, Forrest, we're about to enter our final act in which we're going to be getting some of your top recommendations. But before we do so, let's take a brief moment to thank our sponsors. When you're putting together that masterpiece movie, the coloring is a major creative decision. It can make the difference between whether the audience interprets your story as warm, cold, dark, or light, and it can help define the genre of the film. Here's a quick tip. Horror movies tend to have blue tones. Romantic comedies tend to have warm tones. Apocalyptic movies tend to be gray and washed out. Movies in which reality is off kilter tend to have green tones. And action movies tend to feature a lot of teal and orange, particularly in their artwork. The Emmy Award winning Da Vinci Resolve from Black Magic will help you get that perfect color for your next production. The Da Vinci Resolve 12 combines professional non-linear video editing with the world's most advanced color corrector. So you can now edit, color correct, finish and deliver all from one system. The DaVinci Resolve is completely scalable and resolution independent, so it can be used on set, in a small studio, or integrated into the largest Hollywood production pipeline. From creative editing and multi-camera television production to high-end finishing and color correction, only DaVinci Resolve features the creative tools, compatibility, speed, and legendary image quality that you need to manage your entire workflow, which is why it is the number one solution used on Hollywood feature films. Forrest, welcome to the final act where you'll be sharing incredible resources and mind-blowing answers. Are you ready? I am ready. <laughs> Forrest, um, as someone who is highly educated and who uh, clearly has a lot, has spent a lot of time researching the field that he's in, if there was one book that you could recommend for our listeners, what would it be and why? So the book I would recommend is called Thinking Fast and Slow. And it's by a guy named Daniel Kahneman, who is a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist. And the reason I think this book is so important is it's really the beginnings of what we call behavioral economics. Um, and that is to say uh, human beings have sort of been modeled classically as being rational actors who evaluate the cost of something versus the benefits from it and make logical decisions. 
I mean, that's clearly not how human beings work. No. So, uh, <laughs> so when, when trying to figure out why things in, in specific data sets that I look at may not align with, uh, you know, what I would expect, I go back to this book and I think about what are the incentives that people have to act in a certain way, um, you know, versus the way that I would expect. And so yeah. when you can break down the ways people think about things that may not necessarily be rational, you really start to understand, you know, who a full human being is, and you start to have more of an appreciation for mm. the intricacies that we all all carry with us. So uh, thinking fast and slow is a really great way to begin looking at those distinctions uh, within the human mind and yeah. human personality. It really sounds like it's a blend of art and science. <laughs> well, Film Talk Nation, I know that you love audio. To thank you for joining us today, we partnered with our friends over at Audible to offer you a free audio book. Great titles available include Story by Robert McKee and Save the Cat Strikes Back by Blake Snyder. Um, if you haven't already done so, you can claim your free audio book at audibletrial.com forward slash film talk. That's audibletrial.com forward slash film talk. And this link will also be included in today's show notes. Um, Forrest, if you could recommend a movie for our listeners, um, possibly something that you would maybe even point to as being a good example of, of independent distribution, but you know, not necessarily, what would that movie be and why would you pick that movie? Sure. So one of the first releases on VHX is a film called Indie Game, the movie. I love um, it. The, oh my gosh. It, when I was looking <laughs> at coming, when I was looking at, at coming to you guys and um, I got to meet with um, or to speak with Kathleen, who's one of your very, very talented colleagues. Um, she sent me um, or she gave me access to that movie to kind of get a sense of what the um, online uh, system felt like and looked like and so I found myself watching this movie thinking oh I'm you know I'm just going to watch a few minutes just to kind of see how VHX works and I watched the whole thing through to the final credits it's it's a great movie but yeah please 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 share what Indie Game the movie is about yeah so it's it's basically the process of uh, going from sort of an idea to final uh, release of an independent video game and that means like not involving the major game studios, yes. not involving Sony and Microsoft, but sort of building something for their platforms mm. and then having to go through the process of, of submitting it to those platforms. And it is very, very similar to, to independent film. It is and so I similar. I think that's part of why it yeah. appealed to me, other than the fact that it is a ridiculously compelling and addicting movie um, because – it's kind of mind blowing that um, the documentary filmmakers really managed to capture the most amazing story arc of these independent um, game, you know, gaming programmers that you literally spend this whole movie just being like, these people are nuts to do what they're doing in the same way that you'd look at an independent filmmaker and be like, whoa, like they're nuts. They're mortgaging their house and they're like ruining their health and all of this stuff to make a movie. <laughs> and then you just get the most tremendous payoff at the end of this movie to actually see what happens when those games are released. It's it's an incredible piece. And I think, yeah, I think it's one thing to watch uh, films about filmmaking. So, you know, Lost in La Mancha, which is great. And, yes. and Burden of Dreams, which is fantastic. But when you watch it for another industry, I think you're – slightly more removed i know so right see, yeah you can see it more clearly and uh and it's paint a better painful. picture of it also <laughs> yeah yes oh, oh yes uh and i would say if you go to their website indiegamethemovie.com uh, there is a, a case study for how they made the film yeah i think that's really really important for independent filmmakers to look at because they talk so much about independent distribution and and specifically going direct to their fans they turned mm. down an offer from a traditional distributor so that they could do it themselves and I think that is like the, the preeminent case study for why uh, VHX exists. Like I mean, that is the, the yeah. people we want to serve. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a brilliant, it's, it is such a brilliant movie for filmmakers to watch because it really does. It's like watching the sheer insanity of the independent filmmaking process, but within another industry. And exactly. it just, it's kind of that moment where you, you're just, you're watching this movie being like, wow, this is what my neighbors and my family think of me. Like, this is how they see me, you know? And uh, <laughs> you just, yeah, you just see these people killing themselves for this vision. And yet it pays off. 
And exactly, um, yeah. it's a really, in a lot of ways, I think it's for filmmakers who may be struggling and need some hope. I think it's actually a very encouraging and an edifying movie to watch because you see that even though there is that reality of, of, of uh, just how brutal the work can be and how tough some of the rejection can be, you also really, I think that movie really aptly depicts the why behind it all, um, which we all need to be reminded of from time to time. Um, so, Forrest, I feel almost silly asking you this next question because by definition, I know the answer should should be a VHX. Um, but if you could recommend a website to or app for our listeners, what would it be and why? <laughs> Sure. Well, well, VHX is a great one. But, yes, um, and and I will, say, I will and and the the link for VHX will most definitely be in the show notes. I would I would say uh, you know in addition to us, there is um you know I mentioned Google Analytics before, which is a really yeah. great tool for for measuring the the most basic of of web analytics. And if you're going to do uh, self distribution, uh, you're going to be online, and you're going to need to understand your audience and mm-hmm. how they act online whether they're watching you on their mobile phone or their tablet or their, their laptop, yeah. um, that's going to be something that's super important. And then also for managing uh, your email list, I would say MailChimp is uh, far and away the, the gold don't, standard. Don't you mean MailChimp? <laughs> MailChimp, yeah. <laughs> yeah, somebody else has already taken over that. But <laughs> Fantastic. I think those are some great recommendations and they're recommendations that are very complimentary because as you pointed out, one needs the combination of all of those tools together. Um, well, first, it's time for the martini shot. What parting piece of guidance do you want to share with us? Um, I think the the guidance that I have lived by over the last several years has actually come from uh, a character on a TV show uh, by the name of Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. I, uh, can I just say, when people ask me why I'm single, I feel like saying to them because Ron Swanson doesn't exist. He's like, seriously, <laughs> he's like my dream date. He's just, he's so amazing. Well, then I think I think you'll appreciate this, but I, I think uh, <laughs> there was an episode where he, he mentions uh, uh, never half ass. Uh, two things, whole ass one thing. Exactly. And I think it's important for me to remember from time to time because uh, I, I can be inclined to forget, but uh, dedicate yourself directly to the, the goal yeah. you have in front of you and complete it and, and do a great job and don't try and scatter yourself across uh, across the many winds that, that tend to pull us from place to place. I think that's incredibly wise, Forrest. Well, that's a wrap. Film Talk Nation in this industry, you're only as good as the people you know. And today you've been hanging out with Forrest, Connor, and myself. If you want to go the extra mile, head over to filmtalkpodcast.com and type Forrest, Connor into the search bar. The show notes from today's show will appear along with everything we discuss, like Forrest's recommended book and movie. Forrest, we appreciate you sharing your priceless insight with us today. Film Talk Nation thanks you, and we'll see you on the red carpet. Great, thanks.